So today we'll talk about mental representations and visual imagery. And we're going to a, like a science fiction-like topic of mind reading. Uh, so there's a long debate in psychology about the nature of mental representations. If you are thinking of something, how is that information represented in your mind? If I ask you, think about a cat, and you have a cat in your mind, how can I verify that a cat is in your mind? How do I know how the cat sort of is represented? Um, is this something that we can even study scientifically? It seems like your, your private thoughts are exactly that, they're private. Um, that you can't do any scientific inquiry into your private thoughts. But now, uh, with some clever experiments and some neuroscience, neuroscience techniques, we have, an idea, we have ways to open up the mind and understand what it is that you're doing if you're thinking of something. So today we'll talk about some different ways in which you can represent information. And we'll talk about a, a long debate uh, between researchers. Is, is information, let's say visual information that, that you're imagining, if you form mental images, is that represented in an analogical fashion or some kind of symbolic fashion? And the answer will be a little bit of both. Mostly analogical, but a little bit of uh, symbolic as well. Then what is the relationship between imagery and perception? What's the difference between seeing a cat and imagining that you see a cat or thinking of a cat? Do, do those processes draw on the same, or do, do they draw on the same processes, representations, or is it completely separate? Uh, your mental maps, how are they represent it? Um, what kind of distortions can occur in your mental maps? How accurate or inaccurate are they? And finally, if we know a little bit more about how information is represented in the mind, can we then use that to predict what somebody is thinking of? Uh, can we sort of open up uh, the box? So first, um, some historical perspective. So behaviorist uh, researchers, uh, people like Skinner, who we talked about uh, last week, they proposed that all um, scientific study of behavior should be about um, observable things, the relationship between stimuli and response, or between response and reward. And that you should only allow for very simple internal machinery, um, like simple associations. That's, that's maybe as, as far as you can go uh, from a behaviorist point of view in terms of postulating sort of internal thought. But behaviors were not very happy talking about uh, introspection, somebody talking about what they're thinking of, because it seems so subjective to them. It seems so unscientific. And so imagery was just not a topic of study for a long time. Now, with the advent of, of cognitive psychology, this became a topic of study again. Cognitive psychology is all about internal representations, processes that operate on these internal representations, and it's fine to say that some things are just not observable. Yes, I can't sort of see what it is that you're thinking of, but I can measure other things. And through this indirect uh, link between internal thought, internal representations, and, and observed behavior, I can maybe make some headway into studying, um, into studying uh, imagery. But this is definitely difficult. Mental images are almost by definition subjective. Um, how do we even know that images are used? What, what's their nature? How are they represented? There's a lot of questions. So one of these uh, classic questions is around the, the, the nature of the representation. One way to represent things is in an analog fashion. For example, if you take a, a picture uh, of something, that picture is an analog representation. There's a spatial structure to it. There's a sense of left, right, uh, far away, closer. Um, so the spatial relationships in a picture, they relate to spatial relationships in the real world, the thing that it's representing. So similarly, the things that, are you, that you are thinking of, the, the cat that might be in your mind, maybe that has a spatial structure too. 
somewhere in the neuronal fire, firing pattern, let's say, that could have an analog representation. Now, a different type of representation, non-spatial representation, is, is a symbolic or prepositional representation. So here you abstract away from all the spatial details and you represent things in terms of propositions. Um, and we'll, we'll give some examples of that. And there's been a long debate about, you know, what explains our representations better. And um, in the end, you'll see that both representations, they, uh, they're used to some degree. So here's an example. Suppose we have um, a question like, um, imagine that the can is on the box and the can is black. Okay, so now you conjure up this image of this, this situation. Now, if you have an analog representation in your mind, you, you have some mental image, right? You have something that looks like an actual picture. Um, and so it ha would have spatial structure, right? So you would have a sense of uh, texture and, and, and spatial dimensions, a sense of left, right, up, down. On the other hand, you might also think about it much more abstractly. Um, you might not visualize it very much internally. You might just say, well, what I've, what I've heard so far is uh, some relationships. I heard about a can, I heard about a box, and there's a relationship. Uh, the can is on the box. And you can use symbolic representations where you have uh, relationships and, and objects that, that enter into these relationships with each other. <coughs> Or there might be uh, some property, like uh, you know that the can is black. So maybe this, is, this doesn't seem psychologically plausible, but maybe there's some very abstract representation somewhere um, that keeps track of these abstract relationships between objects. And maybe not going through some kind of image. Does that distinction make sense? OK. So most of the studies uh, that we'll talk about, they will argue for analog representations. We'll talk about mental rotation, brain imaging studies. Um, but there are some interesting differences. Um, a mental image is not quite the same as a visual image, something that you could see uh, in front of you. Looking at something in front of you is not the same as imagining that something is in front of you, let's say. One um, main hypothesis of how imagery works is that imagery is just perception operating in reverse. So we know, um, and, and you learn a lot more about visual perception in, in 9A and 11A, then a visual perception um, information is processed in a sequence of stages. Uh, and at each stage you, you analyze sort of different aspects of the visual scene. Uh, you might analyze what kinds of objects you're seeing. A building, a person, a cat. You might also analyze uh, where you're seeing those objects. Like the cat is, is over here and the house is over there. And as you go through these series of stages, you, you uh, form more and more abstract representations. <laughs> And so there are neurons that are responsible, that respond to when you see a face or when you see a cat. So maybe imagery is just using those very same processes but operating it in reverse. That neuron that's active when you see, let's say, your grandmother, maybe that's also the same neuron that you activate when you imagine seeing your grandmother <coughs> and then sort of these, um, um, let the flow of information sort of go backwards through all these processing stages so that when you conjure up a mental image, what you're doing is, is you're just activating all those neurons in these low-level visual processing areas that would be active if you actually see uh, that image. So maybe imagery is just using very, the, the very same mechanisms as perception. So if that's true, if there's shared resources, shared processes, then mental images should be quasi-pictorial. Um, then there should be analog representations. Uh, and we should see some evidence of that. Right? You, you can do brain imaging studies. You can see you know, what areas are active when people are seeing something. 
in front of them versus when they imagine something. And we should see some overlap in activation. But before we get there, uh, you can also get um, some evidence for what's going on by doing very clever and subtle behavioral experiments. There's a lot of power in, in very simple experiments like this, where you just measure how quickly people are responding uh, to, a, to a question. So the idea behind this experiment is as follows. Um, in the real world, when you see some, somebody up close, you can see that person obviously in more detail than if you see, let's say, your friend from far away. Right? So there's just more detail available if somebody is uh, closer in your visual field. Now maybe if we imagine something being close up, maybe we can also see more detail than if we imagine something further away or, 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 or smaller. So in this experiment, subjects were asked to imagine uh, a target object it, with some relation to another object. So imagine a bee next to a rabbit. And subjects were instructed to hold these objects in a frame so that they both fit and that they're realistically proportioned, right? So the, uh, the bee should be smaller than the rabbit. And then you get the uh, subjects get a surprise question. Does a rabbit have eyebrows? And they answer this question as fast as possible. So they would say, uh, no, I guess. Uh, rabbits don't have eyebrows. And then in another condition, other subjects have to imagine this rabbit standing next to an elephant. Again, holding this into some, uh, some mental frame. And now, of course, they're forced to make this uh, rabbit much smaller in their mental sort of visual field. Now, as it turns out, they are quicker to answer the question about the target object if the target object is, is larger uh, relative to this reference object. So they would be quicker in the left uh, condition than in the right condition. Now, this would make sense if you assume um, that um, the, the, the same areas that are used for visual perception are the areas also used for visual imagery. There's just less detail available if you imagine something very small. So that would take you longer to verify some properties of, the, of an object. Now, interestingly, if you now reverse the, um, the setup and you say, imagine this rabbit standing next to mutant bees that are super large. Um, you can actually reverse this whole effect or this rabbit standing next to a toy elephant, you, you can make people <coughs> faster in this condition and slower in this condition. Um, so it's really, it seems to be really about how large you're imagining these objects. Okay. Now there's also some evidence from neuropsychology. Uh, neuropsychology is about uh, the study of uh, uh, people with brain damage of some sort, and then seeing what, what things they can do or cannot do. And one curious uh, phenomenon is, is hemispatial neglect. These are people um, that for various reasons they can't attend very well things that are in one side of their visual field. So left hemispatial neglect, that's, that's uh, more common than right hemispatial neglect. So these are people that are not blind for things on the left side, they just have a failure to attend to them. They, they don't seem to care very much about that. They don't process the information as much. And this leads to various bizarre um, uh, results where somebody uh, fail, fails to shave one side of their uh, face or they just ignore some uh, half of their body because they don't see it in some sense. Now these same people, they also have a deficit in terms of visual imagery. That's what this slide is about. So this person uh, is a patient in Italy, I think lives next to Florence, next to some famous square that a lot of tourists visit when they visit Italy. And he was asked to imagine standing on one side of the square facing the other side. And then he was asked about what buildings are on your left side when you look at this direction. And he had trouble coming up with the details of, of on that side because, um, right, so that was exactly the part that uh, is associated with this uh, hemispatial neglect, and his imagery seemed to be Im impacted in the same way. Things imagined on the left were just less, more fuzzy, less detailed. 
But curiously, if he was now asked to mentally walk over to the other side of the square, turn around, face the other direction, he was perfectly able to list off all the details about the buildings that were uh, sort of previously in his blind spot, uh, but he could, he could see it now. Um, so that gives some suggestion that uh, imagery and, and, and uh, visual perception, that they share some, some common resources. Now here's some evidence from, um, from neuroscience. There's lots of studies like this, but this is a very simple one. You can put somebody in an, in an MRI scanner um, and then use a technique called fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. And you don't have to know the details of how this works, but you measure the increase or decrease in blood flow in the brain in response to something in the experiment, something that the subject is seeing or uh, instructed to do. And these are tiny little changes in blood flow. Uh, so neurons perhaps working a little bit harder, they need more oxygen, and you can measure this change in, in oxygen uptake. So in this experiment, subjects in one uh, phase of the experiment, they saw a visual stimulus. Um, I think it was a checkerboard pattern, the details don't really matter that much. But this was stimulating the uh, lower level visual areas, the, 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 the visual striate cortex, sort of in the back of your, uh, of your brain. And this not surprisingly activated these neurons in that, that uh, cortical area and that led to an increase in the blood flow. And when you turn the stimulus off, you can see that activity goes down again. Again, no surprise whatsoever. But now the subjects were asked to imagine seeing that same stimulus again. And mysteriously, you see the same area, the visual striate cortex, these very low level visual processing areas being active again. Right? It seems like conjuring up this mental image means that you are using those very same neurons that were used to see the thing. You can also see that the activation is not quite as strong as when um, the stimulus is actually there. So imagining something, uh, which is a good thing, imagining something leads to an activation that's not quite as strong as seeing something. Yeah? You don't want to hallucinate. You want to be able to distinguish between things that are actually there versus made up. Does this make sense, this study? Okay, so there's lots of evidence showing this um, similarity between images and um, pictures, but there are some differences that we'll, we'll discuss. So if you see a picture, um, you can look at the picture many ways, and you can come up with different interpretations. Uh, something that you didn't see before, you can see now in a different way. That's much harder to do with mental images. Once you form a mental image, it usually comes with some kind of interpretation of what it is that you're seeing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's essentially a mental image is, is, a, is a percept along with some interpretation. So let's, let's give a demonstration. If you flipped ahead with the slides, you already know the answer. But for those of you who did not look ahead, um, so look at this fig figure, and you have to remember it for a later imagery um, uh, imagery task. This one? Did you see it? Now the question is what would that object look like when you rotate it 90 degrees clockwise? How many of you have no idea what, what that would be? <laughs> okay, so it's tough, but some of you said seahorse, right? So yes, it's a, it's a seahorse, but this is difficult, right? So you might see a, 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 a slug of some kind, and that interpretation might stick with this mental image, and once that sticks, it's hard to undo that interpretation. 
So that's one difference between imagery and perception. Here's another one where I ask you to imagine this, the, the object that I'll show you in a, in a slightly different way. So if I rotate that 90 degrees, what is that? Texas. Texas. Yeah, I guess you, I already primed you. You're already, you're already mentally rotating this thing in your head. Um, but you're right. Yeah, so this is Texas. If you do this under, under sort of experimental conditions, people not primed, they don't quite know what question will follow, 0% uh, of subjects will know the answer. Um, and you, you really need to... Uh, give people a heads up so that they can sort of hold open for the possibility that this is multiple interpretations. Okay, so if so, most of you will have difficulty uh, changing the interpretation of something that's already in your mind. Uh, if you have a mental image in, in your mind, and that's very different from visual perception, where you can go back and forth. Right, with ambiguous figures, you can just focus on different aspects of a figure and see different things. Now here's a, here's a tricky one, uh, and I hope you did not look ahead on the slides. Um, so if you put your index finger and thumb in front of you, okay, now imagine that there's a cube that you hold by the opposite corners, right, diagonally opposite corners. So if you have vivid Im imagery, right, you, this thing is right in front of you, okay? You have the thing, thing in front of you? So what, where are the other corners? So you are pointing over there, okay? How many corners do you see? Four. Four, okay. So does anybody have a different answer? It shouldn't be very difficult, right? You've seen a cube so many times, and... <laughs> do you know that, or do you see it? Both. Both. It's hard to imagine, right? I think. I think it's pretty difficult to imagine. It's not four, yeah, it's six. There should be six corners. And also, do they lie in one plane? They do not. That's the other thing that's, that's tricky to imagine. So here's the answer. This is what many of you, including myself when I first saw it, see. Right? You think of this object, which is not a cube, right? but it's easy to imagine. Um, and then you have four corners, uh, and they all lie in one plane. But the correct solution is you actually have six other uh, corners, and they do not lie in a plane. So what's going on here? Well. Um, Imagery is maybe not as precise as visual perception. Maybe it goes without saying, you just don't have the same level of detail available. So things are just more fuzzy. But there could also be an influence of symbolic representations at work. Maybe when you think of a cube, you're thinking about uh, the sides of a cube, which have four corners. So you maybe have that number four in your mind. Uh, you're thinking about things that are, you know, lying nicely in a plane, and maybe that influences your answer uh, and the way you imagine those other corners. So maybe your symbolic knowledge about cubes is affecting um, your answer here. Uh, now here's, so imagine this object, got that? And I should say, I should move forward. So does this figure, so the Star of David, um, or I think it's also called a hexagram, does this figure contain a parallelogram? Now, this is not a class about geometry, so some of you might be wondering, what the heck is a parallelogram again? So it is, it's this object, so a square and a rectangle, a parallelogram, so it just has two pairs of parallel sides, right? So you can take a, a square and then squish it, and it still has these two parallel sides. Does this figure have parallelograms? Yes. 
No? That's a hard question. It's actually even hard when you see the thing in front of you, but it becomes really, really hard if you don't see it and you have to imagine it. So, let's see. Uh, where is it actually? <laughs> uh, oh, I'm always terrible at this. Um, oh yeah. yeah, I see it again. Right, so that's one of them. <laughs> right, so yeah, I, I have to admit, this is even hard when you see the thing in front of you. Um, one difficulty here is that you, most of you parse this as two overlapping triangles. And so then it's very difficult to, to go across these representations. Um, and once this, this thing, this figure is in your mind, it's hard to undo this interpretation of two, two overlapping triangles. Now, um, another question is if, if, if you have something, uh, some mental image, when you manipulate it, how is that manipulation done? What, is that similar to manipulating the real object in the real world? If you, if you think about holding a hammer and swinging it back and forth, the way you represent that internally is that the same, is that, is that some analogy between actually holding the hammer and swinging it. So one researcher did a very clever study to understand um, uh, rotations of objects, mental rotations. And he argued that um, mentally rotating objects is very similar to actually physically rotating the object. It sort of takes time to rotate objects physically and it takes time to rotate objects uh, mentally. And he showed a very nice, ex he did a nice experiment where he asked people to verify if two objects are, um, can be rotated into correspondence. And they have to say as quickly as possible, uh, uh, same or different. Same if they are, belong to the same object or different if, if they cannot be rotated into alignment. So here's a little, little um, here's some example trials. So can these be aligned by rotating them? <coughs> so the answer is same, yeah? So it's the same object. How about this one? <coughs> so this would be different, right? Um, how about this one? So this one would be different. This one. This is a tougher, tougher one. You have to do a bit more work. This is different. How about this one? Same. All right, one more. So this one is a little easier. That's different. And you go on and on and on with lots of trials. Now, in this experiment, as I said, you measure how long it takes for people to say same and different. And when you plot the, the results, what's, most, what's of most interest is when people say same, when the, the answer should be same, they say same, so they make a correct response. And then you plot the response time. Uh, you plot the response time as a function of the angle between the two objects. And the finding is, not surprisingly, if two objects are further out of alignment, if, it, if you need to, need to rotate them more, it takes longer time to verify that they're the same object. But what's really remarkable is that the relationship between response time and angle is roughly linear. So if you look at this plot, in the time span of one second or so, uh, it takes about one second per 40 degrees of, of angle between these objects. And for each uh, consecutive sort of 40 degrees, you add another second. And this suggests that mental rotation has a constant speed. Uh, it's about 40 degrees a second. 
It's as if you were just actually physically rotating that thing um, or that, that 3D object with some constant speed. So that's one uh, important finding. The other important finding, it doesn't seem to matter. The top graph is for rotation in the picture plane, right? So just right in that, um, that same um, plane that the picture is in, uh, you can measure the angle there. But some of these rotations are rotations in depth. But if you compare the slope of these two curves, the slope is about the same. In other words, the mental rotation, the speed of mental rotation is the same whether you need to rotate it sort of within one picture or in some 3D fashion. It's as if you know you were actually manipulating some sculpture mentally um, with some with some constant speed. Does that experiment make sense to you? Okay. So there's also some um, uh, interesting ways in which um, mental representations uh, they can lead to various distortions uh, that are somewhat counterintuitive. Uh, if I ask you which is further west, the Atlantic entrance of the Panama Canal or the Pacific entrance of the Panama Canal? So Pacific Ocean is, is generally on the west of the Atlantic. So which entrance to the Panama Canal would be further west? Does that, is anybody convinced or confident about their answer? So it's, it's, uh, it's not what you would think it is. Um, the Panama Canal actually runs from the from a sort of a western entry point on the Atlantic to an eastern exit point on the uh, Pacific Ocean. But most of you probably think about the Panama Canal sort of uh, running uh, from east to west. Um, so this is a little counterintuitive. How about this one? Which is further east, the, the state of Florida or the country of Chile? Florida's further east? So Florida's actually further west. Uh, but many of you probably think about sort of North America, South America as being aligned, uh, that that's the only difference, uh, north and south. But there's also an east-west difference. Uh, that often gets ignored uh, when you form a mental map. How about going further, further close? Um, this is something you should know about. Which is further east, uh, Reno or San Diego? Reno's further east. I hear, I hear Reno a lot. And why would Reno be further east? Actually, so San Diego is further east. <laughs> you have a comment or, yeah? So what's the line of reasoning? Why, why would you say that uh, Reno is further east? So this, this might be your line of reasoning. Um, so Nevada is east of California. Reno's in Nevada, San Diego's in California, therefore Reno must be east of San Diego. Right? So you, you might use your, part of your symbolic knowledge, part of your knowledge about hierarchical relationships, what's part of what? And then the relationships between uh, states, in this case, to, to, to give an answer. Uh, but that leads to some of these distortions. Um, that those strategies, they work well in many circumstances, but they occasionally go wrong. So here's some experimental evidence that suggests that um, higher order relations um, are used when you reason with mental maps or cognitive maps. 
So in this experiment, subjects were asked to study the locations of fictitious uh, cities, X, Y, and Z. Right? So they see a map in front of them. And they also learned that X is part of Alpha County, and Z and Y are part of Beta County. That's in one condition. And then later, they're asked the same question again about Reno uh, and San Diego. Which is further east, X or Y? So in this condition, the information about which city is part of what county and what is, what is the relationship to be Alpha County and Beta County is congruent, right? If you use your knowledge about Beta County being east of Alpha County, and you know that Y is part of Beta County and X is part of Alpha County, your answer would be correct. However, in, these, in this incongruent condition, this very same spatial positions were used for X, Y, and Z, but now they learn that X is also part of beta, or X is part of Beta County, and Y is part of Alpha County. And now your higher order uh, knowledge is, is in opposition um, to sort of the local uh, knowledge. And the result is uh, people make far more mistakes in this condition. So when subjects study mental maps, they don't just use uh, some continuous representation. Uh, and an exact spatial representation of these locations, they use other knowledge. What is part of what as a way to reason about uh, spatial locations? Okay. So to summarize uh, the results so far, uh, there's a lot of evidence from neuroscience, neuropsychology, and some behavioral experiments that imagined information is similar to perceptual information, but with there are also some differences. So mental images are difficult to reinterpret. They're more fuzzy. They lack some detail. And they can be distorted by knowledge of you know, symbolic relationships, you know, more abstract knowledge. Uh, your mental maps are not just, not, not purely analog. All right, any question about this? Then the last topic um, is about mind reading. So if, if we know how things are represented in the brain, when we see something, hear something, we're thinking of something, can we then use that knowledge to understand or predict what somebody's thinking of. And it seems kind of far-fetched, but the last uh, 15 years or so, we've made remarkable progress. So the earliest experiments were very simple experiments where uh, a subject is in a uh, scanner, an fMRI scanner. Brain activity is measured in response to visual stimuli, like a subject might see a bottle or a shoe or things from a small number of categories. And as they are watching these, uh, these pictures, you measure the brain's response, uh, and you find subtle differences. So if people are watching a bottle, you, it's slightly different brain activation pattern than if they're, watching, uh, if they're seeing a shoe. The question is, is there some consistency or systematicity to these brain activations? Or is it seemingly random? Every time when you look at something, some random activation pattern occurs. If that's true, then we could never predict what it is that you're seeing based on brain activation. But as it turns out, there is some systematicity in brain activation because you can build algorithms, and how you build these algorithms is not uh, of importance in this class. You can build algorithms that learn to predict what it is that you're seeing based on the activation pattern basically how much blood flow is occurring in various parts of the brain. You can predict with 96% accuracy whether somebody is looking at a face, a cat, uh, scissors, chairs, etc. Uh, from these eight categories, 96% accuracy. Which is awesome, right? This, like, how would this even work? Well, it works because uh, if you were looking at a face, there are very specific neurons that respond to faces.
If you, if you look at a scissors, not only there are neurons that are respon responsive to scissor, seeing a scissor, but also the idea of holding a scissor. You might be actually mentally thinking about holding it and cutting something. And that leads to another sort of very typical activation pattern, which these algorithms can learn from. But the drawback here is that we can now predict things from a limited set of categories. Like you might be thinking of a face, but we don't know if you are looking at a happy face or a sad face. Uh, if the object does not fall in these categories, we don't know uh, what it is that you might be thinking of. So the last couple of years, um, there's been some effort in trying to decode um, or reconstruct a mental image. And this gets a little bit towards science fiction. Suppose somebody's looking at an image like a, like a screwdriver. You measure the brain ac activation response. And you measure this for lots and lots of different images, or even movies. And then you build a model that tries to reconstruct that image. It literally tries to visualize what it thinks it is seeing based on the brain response. Now, can this work? Well, the last couple of years, there's been amazing demonstrations of this. Let's see, can I get this to work? How do I undo this pointer option? Well, that's not fun. Wait. There we go. Okay. So again, there's a whole bunch of details. The details don't, don't matter very much. Uh, subjects were in a scanner and they were watching movies. Um, and then this algorithm learned to reconstruct that visual image, or actually a sequence of visual images that they were looking at. And the result is shown here on the right. Now you can see the algorithm is not very good. Right? It's kind of blurry. It's, sometimes it misses a whole bunch of important detail. But on the other hand, it's surprisingly accurate. Right? When somebody's looking at a face, it's possible to make something face-like. Uh, so this seems to be a real error. But it gets color sometimes, right? It gets some part of the texture, right? So here it's actually, it knows it's looking, at, the subject is looking at a face. This is unclear, it's kind of blurry. Now why is this important? Because in the end, um, we would like to, uh, uh, people that are in a coma, let's say, but are still brain active in some way, can we read out what they're thinking of? Um, can we use this as prosthetics in some sense to, to help people, um, to help understand you know, what is it that people are, that, that are in people's minds? Or even what people are dreaming of. So this is a demonstration um, where again you see the, the, the clip that people are watching here in the top left. This is the reconstructed um, motion sequence for three subjects, subject one, two, and three. And the twist here is that um, they've used YouTube videos to try to explain this sort of fuzzy pattern on the left. Because sometimes it's hard to understand, you know, okay, what, what does this algorithm believe that the subject is watching? So it's trying to explain your thoughts in terms of YouTube movies. Uh, and sometimes it gets it correct. So when you're thinking of, you know, people, um, you can explain it in terms of YouTube clips that contain people. So in the end, you know, this is, we need to do a lot more work, uh, but maybe we can decode um, uh, dreams or, or internal thoughts. The other um, sort of science fiction-y uh, projects that are going on the last couple of years is in terms of decoding speech. So when somebody is uh, hearing human speech, there are well-known areas uh, in, in cortex, the human auditory cortex, that are activated based on human speech. Now again, using various algorithms that we won't have to go into, you can reconstruct what somebody's hearing um, based on just the neuronal firing patterns in human auditory cortex. 
Now, in this experiment, subjects were uh, listening to words, and then they had to uh, pronounce those words. In other conditions, they had to think of a word, and then using their own inner voice um, to, to, to sort of sound it out. And then the algorithm would predict what it is that you're uh, thinking of. So the, um, the first sound, I believe, was the sound that was played to them. The second sound is the reconstructed sound, like what it thinks it is that the brain is, is hearing. So and again, you could think of, about applications. People whose vocal cords are damaged can't talk anymore. Perhaps we can read out what it is that they want to say based on uh, reading out the mind. Now, the takeaway point here is just that how the brain represents things, there's a systematic, uh, there's a systematicity to it, right? It's not, it's not random. Um, there's some similarities within one person. When you see a cat, you always represent sort of similar areas in your brain. There's some systematicity also across people. Different people seeing the, uh, a cat or thinking about a word, <clears throat> similar areas again are activated. And these algorithms just exploit uh, this systematicity. All right, so that's it for today. I'll see you um, on Thursday.